and welcome back to another episode of me reading stories to you. So this will be Wayward Chapter 19. Uh, you might remember last time we had some relationship stuff going on between Michaela and Cray. And also some more questions asked about the, the nature of the coven in Bristol. What's going on with that and how come they never see anybody from there. And just a little bit more fallout from Michaela's first contact with her old life since running away little bit of a content warning for this episode it does deal with some upsetting subject matter mostly relating to alcoholism and teen drinking and without further ado here is chapter 19 next morning i drag myself out of bed into the freezing cold of the house downstairs in the kitchen i hunt down a box of frosties which seem appropriate given the ice crystals on the windows and I open a carton of uht milk there aren't any clean bowls so i dig out a dusty saucepan rinse it with some milk and give it a wipe with some kitchen roll with my pan of cereal, I make my way to the living room and sit down. The whole house smells musty and damp, like a swimming kit I once left in my locker over the summer holidays. Munching my breakfast, I take a look out into the garden and realise there's frost on the inside of the window. Shit. I've sort of lost track of the weeks, but it must almost be Christmas, because the decorations have gone up on campus, all those tiny fake trees and balding tinsel. Putting down my saucepan, I quickly glamour my hoodie into a fur-lined dressing gown. Cray has glamoured himself a thick black jumper. He comes tramping down the stairs, followed by Chronicle, whose normally pale skin is a painful-looking red on her nose and around her mouth. She has a green fur hat on her head and an emerald green jumper dress to match. Fuck, it's cold, she says, rubbing her hands together. They're just as red as her nose and the chapped skin of her lips. She reaches up and touches her face, glamouring it so that she appears perfect again. We're all going to freeze to death. Cray drops down on the sofa next to me and pinches my spoon, delving into the Frosties. Ugh, I don't even remember what it was like to be warm. Campion complains, shuffling into the room in a red jumper with a black fur jacket on top. I'd kill for a cup of tea, I say. Or a hot toddy, Ilick says, coming down the stairs. He's clearly hanging, even under his glamour. Campion, any chance of a little healing potion? Campion rolls her eyes. If you want to avoid feeling like this, try not drinking the whole bottle in one night. Ilex gives her the finger and slouches off to the kitchen. I'll get my stove, Campion says. Think there's enough gas left for a pot of tea. Cray kicks the cushions into a circle on the floor and offers me the Frosties back. Chronicle hunkers down on the cushions and glares at the floor in the centre. I can hear Ilex muttering in the kitchen and rattling around mugs and cups. He's probably looking for painkillers. He won't find any. I'd had the world's worst cramps the week before and kept popping them like millions. By the time Campion had come back with the stove and boiled up water for tea, Nara has emerged from upstairs. Out of all of us, she is handling the cold best and doesn't seem to care about the frost on the windows or the damp dishcloth smell. She accepts a cup of tea when Cray ladles one out for her, and we sit in a circle, blowing on our cups and warming our hands around them. Ilex grumbles under his breath until Campion sighs and reaches into a pocket of her coat. She takes out a miniature vodka bottle. It's not full of clear liquid, though. The contents are brownish green, like pond water. Bless you. Ilex takes the bottle and unscrews the top, downing the contents with a small shudder. His body loses its pained hunch, and he sits up a little more, opening his eyes to the light with a sigh. Cray rolls his eyes. Who wants to go to the library today? Nora asks. They've got some new books on ancient ritual magic for the religious studies courses. Nerd, Alex says. But fine, I could use a few hours in the warm with a good book. A dirty book? We all know they've got an erotica section for the creative writers, Chronicle says. Alex sticks out his tongue. Yeah, all right, Campion says, and Chronicle nods her agreement. Might as well. Stone? Cray asks. Sure. Lunch at the Union? Campion asks. There are happy agreements all round. Campion packs up her stove and we all climb out the front window into the chilly morning air. I change my dressing gown into a coat and add a fluffy black hat for good measure. It seems that glamours aren't as effective as actual clothes at keeping out the cold. No matter how thick and fluffy I make my jumpers and coats, there's never really anything to them. Christmas is everywhere on campus, even more than on my last visit. There are paper chains in all the fogged up windows of the student housing blocks, fake snow and paper snowflakes like at a primary school. I raise my eyebrows at it all. They're supposed to be 18, not 8 after all. Lots of people are wearing stupid Christmas jumpers from Primark and there's a huge Christmas tree outside the library doors, decked in lights. Christmas is closed then, I say to Cray as we get into the warm building, dodging students in their pyjamas and heading for the rows of well-lit books. It's in two weeks. I falter and his hand slips into mine. I know it's hard not being with them. Yeah, but I'll be okay, I say, not really feeling it. Look at them. Alex mutters, nodding towards the sleepy students dressed in half clothes and half pyjamas. They've all just rolled out of beds that haven't been made since September. I realise that he's trying to make me feel better, that all of them know how much I've been missing mum and dad. 
Ilex might be a dick, but he's actually trying not to be. I don't think any of them are wearing proper clothes, I say. That one's just got a onesie under a jumper. Shh, animals, Ilex sneers, winking at me before heading into the maze of shelves. What are we looking for today, then, Cray says. They've got magazines, novels, books on magic, internet access, dark corners where no one ever goes. Cray's eyes widen. Oh, there's a few of those. He tugs me in the direction of a set of fire doors and into a corridor with a sign on the wall saying newspaper archives. In the dusty room at the end of the corridor, there are piles of newspapers on the shelves and a sofa shoved right into the corner under a ledge with a dying spider plant on it. Cray sinks down on the sofa and pulls me with him. I feel lightheaded, happy. It's warm and comfortable and Cray and I are alone in the quiet corner, hidden. I lean forwards and kiss him. Cray? Hmm? Teach me to astral project. His eyebrows shoot up, lashes fluttering as he blinks. What? We can kiss later. Right now I want to learn how to astral project. He grumbles, pouting. Which? Speak for yourself. I'm not there yet. He sighs and kisses my nose before settling back on the sofa. Okay, fine, meanie. I sit up straight and fold my legs and time scrunched up against the opposite arm. The crash course on astral projection, Cray begins. That's leaving your body and wandering around on this plane. On any other plane, it's coupled with path working, but that's something we might never get to. All right. Astral projection is simple in the idea, but not so much in the doing. What you need to do is strongly visualise where you are, control your breathing, and then step out of your body. Just step out. That's it. Like I said, it's hard. and I'm not very good at it. None of us are, really. I mean, I can get out and walk around the room, but anything beyond that requires a lot of focus and energy. Sophia's the only one who could do it well. Why doesn't Sophia teach it then, if she's so good? Sophia doesn't teach new recruits. The basics are common knowledge between all of us. Sophia teaches the mysteries, the higher level stuff, which is only Ilex and Chronicle know and they can't talk about it. They've never even mentioned. No, they, they physically can't talk about it. That's one of the rules, to keep silent. When they were initiated to the higher rank, they swore an oath which was bound in ritual. Those green pendants they wear are symbols. So now I know why the word witch stuck in my throat when I tried to tell Chloe. I might not be a high level member of the coven, but I'm clearly still bound somehow. I feel a wave of goosebumps prickle my skin. So many things about the coven worry me, or did worry me when I first saw them. The house, the names, Sophia and her creepy goth makeup. I tell myself that this is just another one of those things that seems weird and scary at first, but actually turns out to be almost normal. Ready? Cray asks. Ready. Okay. Eyes closed. Breathe evenly. In through your mouth, out through your nose. Slowly. I breathe in and out. My nose whistles. This is stupid. Michaela, I open one eye. Stone. Concentrate. I breathe and let my body relax. Automatically, I reach for the energy in the earth, pulling it up through my chakras, as Chronicle told me to so many weeks ago. The feeling is familiar. Everything grows distant. My breathing automatic and calm. My palms tingle. The energy flows through my body, into my skin and hair, covering me. I can see the room around me even with my eyes closed, not as one thing, but as a hundred tiny pieces of things. The colour of the walls, the texture of the carpet, the creaking of the door, the smell of dust and books and the heat from the radiators. Step out, Cray says, from a long way away. I stand up, but don't move. The room is there, whole now, and my body is sitting on the sofa. I feel like whooping because I've done it, but I find I have no voice. I take a step, not feeling the floor under me. I stand beside Cray. He's watching my body, a crease between his eyebrows. There's a shimmer around him, grey, like fog. I reach out and my hand looks just like it usually does, but it passes right through him. It's like being a ghost. I realise that I'm not breathing, though my body still is. I can sort of feel it, even though my astral mouth and nose aren't drawing in any air. Still, as I touch his shoulder, he turns my way, looking through me. Stone? I grin. This is so cool. The room around me isn't interesting enough, though, and I'm not ready to jump back into my body. The door to the corridor is closed, but, well, if I can go through Cray, then I can go through a door. The corridor is deserted, and I make my way back to the main library. My body is safe with Cray, I know that. Right now, I want to find the others and spy on them. Even though I've only been in the library twice, today, and back when Nora brought me to call my parents, I can see every detail clearly. The shelves are as easy to pass through as the door, and I read titles as I go. Titles I've never read before. I can't be imagining it. All those titles and the posters on the walls, the people running about. It's all real. I stumble through Ilex as I leave a wall of books. He has the same grey shimmer as Cray. It must be a witch thing. He blinks, turns to look at me, and then in the other direction up the aisle. 
I'd laugh at his face if I could make a noise. Instead, I dodged through the wall behind him and into a room filled with sofa and desks. Campion and Chronicle were cuddled up in one armchair, flipping through a magazine. Nara is stretched out on the sofa with a thick book on Celtic magic. There's a weird blue shimmer around the doorway to the room, not the same as the grey one that covers my friends. Ignoring the others, I take a closer look. Is it magic? It must be. After all, these are three witches in the room, plus one astral projecting almost witch. Weird. There are Christmas garlands here too, plus a tree made out of green paper tacked to a board. I wonder if mum and dad have taken the tree out of the loft yet. Is it in the corner of the living room beside the TV, shedding green plastic needles, the fairy leaning drunkenly to one side like it always does? This year I won't watch the East End special with mum while dad cooks the dinner. I won't have a glass of fizz with my turkey or pull crackers with them. I won't get to fall asleep to the late film with my head in mum's lap. It doesn't matter how awful it was for Cray when he tried to go home. I need to see them. I want to see my mum and dad. The room blurs around me and a sharp pain in my arm makes me jump. I open my eyes and see Cray looking at me. Unfolding my legs feels like getting up after a full night's sleep. Did you pinch me? I mumble, my mouth dry as sandpaper. You were out for a really long time, Cray says defensively. Thirty minutes. Oh, I wince as I get to my feet and stretch. Where did you go? I felt you come up to me and then you were gone. You felt me? Cool. I went into the library and saw Alex. Everyone else is in the lounge over the other side. He went out there. Cray looks at the door as if it's painted on the wall. Yeah, why? It's just... I mean, I'm not good at it. I can't really go further than the room I'm already in. His cheeks are pink and he ducks his head, not looking at me. Aw. Oh, shut up, Cray mutters. Chronicle can just about manage to go around the house, but not outside. She says she kind of gets blown away. I didn't try going outside, but I do feel like hammered shit. You're still a bit outside yourself. All that energy is still humming. You should eat something to ground yourself. Lunch? Sounds good. We find Alex in the study room with the others. From outside, I can't see the blue shimmer. But as we get near the door, I see a student go up to it, frown and turn away. There's a sign on it, closed for decoration. There's a spell on the door, I say. How can you tell? It was glowing blue before, when I was being all floaty. That sign's a glamour. Cray pushes open the door. Ilex looks up from his novel. Love birds. Finished already? How embarrassing. Cray ignores him. Stone astral projected for the first time. Well done, Nara says, smiling. Campion and Chronicle nod along. Did you jump out at me? Ilex asks. A little bit. Ilex rolls his eyes. I would kill someone for a latte right now, Campion groans. Let's go to the Union. At least they have music. The walk to the Union takes us along the fence of a field full of muddy sheep, bleating out clouds of hot breath into the cold air. The sandy path is wet, and the yellow sludge of it sticks to my shoes. Unlike the shivering students dragging their bags of books with them, I can glamour mine clean again. We're not invisible. People look at us with drawn-together brows. We must look younger than them, or at least Cray, Nara and I do. No one actually stops us, though, so after a while I relax, though I still half expect someone to recognise me. If what Chloe said about me being considered missing is true, there must be pictures in the news or something. But no one does. The union is around the corner from the last building on campus, halfway across the rear car park towards the rugby field. I'd seen it while walking with Cray, but never been in before. Inside, it smells like rubber and chips. Through two sets of double doors is a huge room the size of my school's gym. The walls are a horrible orange and made of concrete blocks. The floor is grey, with glitter, dust and sticky spots on it. The far wall is a bar with a display of bottles behind it. There's a coffee machine and a door to a busy kitchen where two acne-covered students are working hard in the steam. Campion leads us over to a booth in the corner with baggy leather on the seats that sighs when we all sit down. I'm between Cray and Ilex. The others are squeezed in opposite. There's a poster about chlamydia testing on the wall above us and over Nara's head is a plasma screen with a bright green text on it warning that spiking someone's drink is illegal. No shit. Hmm, what to have, what to have... Chronicle flips the laminated menu over and frowns at it. You always have the steak pasty, Campion says. But maybe this time I won't. Even as I'm saying it, I know it won't happen. Pasty and chips, please, plus a beer. Campion goes to order because she's on the end. Ilex is too, but getting him to go and order for all of us seems like a fight not worth starting. We've all contributed glamoured stones and buttons to pay with. She comes back with a tray of dripping plastic pint glasses. We drink beer and complain about the music which I actually like, not having my iPod. It's the first time I've heard Jesse J in months. And the lack of heating at the house. Campion's much-needed latte arrives with our food, plates of chips, and a panini oozing with cheese and tomato, plus Chronicles pasty. 
We wolfed down the food. I'd forgotten what proper food was like, as we've been living on packet soup and instant noodles for ages, save that one bacon sandwich at the cafe that I hadn't gotten to finish. Chips. Oh god, chips. I even end up stealing some craze. I don't want to look like a pig, but they're so gorgeous I don't care. Ah, I feel like a hippo, Chronicle groans, patting her stomach. You are a hippo, Alex mutters into his beer. Dick. Bitch. Kids, don't fight or we'll separate you, Cray says. Nara giggles. Chronicle sticks her tongue out. We really need to warm that house up, Campion sighs. We have to live there, you know? There has to be a way. Shame you can't just glamour it warm, I say. Yeah, that would be... Wait, what? Campion blinks at me. You know, like how you glamour things not just to look a certain way, but to smell or feel different. It's a shame we can't glamour the house to feel warm. Stone, you are surprisingly smart for a stoner, Alex says. Not a stoner anymore, I say. But can we do that? Glamour it? Not our whole house, but maybe one object. We'd have to renew it every seven hours, but it's better than nothing, Campion says. I'm getting coffee for the road. We used all the gas in the canister, Chronicle nudges Nora. Move your bum. On the way back to the house, I lick spot something off the path in the woods. He dodges off into the trees, calling over his shoulder. I found something. It's perfect. Following him through the drifts of wet leaves and the stretches of bare wet mud, we pick our way to where Ilex is standing over a pile of broken bricks and bits of concrete that someone's just dumped in the woods. Here. He points at something on the ground. By leaning over the pile of rubbish, I can see it's a white stone statue. A goat-legged man playing pan pipes, surrounded by forest animals. A deer, rabbits and some squirrels. That thing's creepy as fuck, Cray says. Let's take it home. I'm not touching it, it looks disgusting, Chronicle says. There could be snails. I'll do it. Cray picks up the statue and tucks it under his arm like a log. We carry it home, get it in through the window, and stand in the middle of the living room on the bare bit of floor in the middle of the cushioned circle. I'm not really sure how this is going to work, Nara says. I'll get my grimoire, Ilex says. I've got some symbols in there that we can copy to draw our power together. He runs upstairs and comes back with a tatty notebook with pages sticking out of it at odd angles. He unties the string, keeping it all together, and opens it, flipping through the pages. Does anyone have a pen? I'll get some incense, Nora says, vanishing into the kitchen. Cray and I gather candles from around the room to make a circle around the cushions. Chronicle digs a lipstick out of her pocket and holds it out to Ilex. I can always nick another one. You can just glamour yourself, Ilex reminds her, uncapping the gold tube and twisting up the blood red stick. I like having them, looking at them, keeping them in a big box in my room. You know, like you in the gay times. Is that supposed to embarrass me? He asks. Chronicle rolls her eyes. With candles lit and Nora's incense smouldering in a bowl on the floor, we all sit down and around the statue and join hands at some unspoken signal. Ilex has drawn red runes and symbols on the pillar. The candlelight makes the fawn look even creepier, like it's snarling rather than grinning. OK, we're all going to throw the same glamour, Ilex says, the statue radiating heat, glowing with it and hot to the touch. We get it. Call the quarters already, Chronicle snaps. Ilex gives her an irritated look, but proceeds to call the elements to start us off invoking the god and goddess to finish casting the circle. Together we call up power, raising it in the circle until it feels like it's closing over my head. I'm drowning in the tingling, fuzzy presence of so much energy. As if that's the sign we've been waiting for, that overload, I feel everyone start to push their energy into the statue. I do the same. I try to think of the statue as being made of metal, like a copper wire in a flame, glowing red with heat, or the blinding white of a light bulb's tiny wire. I visualise it hissing as droplets of water land on the fawn's face. I banish the damp cold from my skin and instead feel dry heat bathe my face and hands like sitting in front of the electric fire at home. Swallowing, I open my eyes and look at the statue. It's working. Everyone else opens their eyes and we all look at the statue, which is glowing a reddish-orange in the centre. Slowly, the light dims, but the statue continues to radiate heat and I hold my hand out to feel the warmth. Who actually thought that would work? Campion asks. Shut up, this is amazing, I tell her. We still have to recast every seven hours. One of us should be enough if we don't actually let the glamour fade entirely, Ilex says. We'll have to experiment. We close the circle and settle down to enjoy the heat and flip through the books Nora took from the library, which she promises she's going to take back, eventually. After a while, Ilex goes to the kitchen and comes back with a bottle of vodka. I see Chronicle and Cray exchange a look. Bit early, Chronicle says carefully. Yeah, if I had parents or school to go to, I'd be in a lot of trouble. He twists the cap off and takes a deep drink, wrinkling his nose at the taste. Ilex, slow down, Campion says. Oh my god, shut up. 
Alex gestures with the bottle. Vodka splashes onto the patchy carpet. No one's saying you have to have any. I don't want to be in the room while this is happening. It's horrible. Campion's jaw sets and Chronicle lays a warning hand on her arm. They leave it alone after that. Alex sprawls out on the sofa and takes long pulls on the bottle while I flip through pages and pretend to read. Everyone's so tense. I think I'll go practice my projecting, I say to cry. Okay, be careful. Cast a circle this time. I won't be around to make one for you. I will. I make for the stairs and I'm halfway up when I hear Ilex's voice calling from the living room. Watch out for demons, princess. There's a burst of angry muttering. Campion, probably. I go into the bathroom and close the door. With the bedding rolled out of the way, I sit down and light a black candle. Black, I have learnt, absorbs negativity. It's not an evil thing at all. Every stupid horror film I've ever seen a sleepover was wrong about that. The raising of energy and casting of a circle is familiar to me now, like putting on makeup or straightening my hair. I could do it in my sleep. Once I'm done, I close my eyes and visualise the room. It's simple because I've spent so much time in it. Even the shapes of the cracks and the plaster are easy to picture. Just like before in the library, I see myself standing up and leaving my body, taking a step out into the room. I glide through the wall and into the boys' room. I've been curious about how they live, or how Ilex lives now that Cray's with me. It's smaller than the girls' room, clearly the box room of the house. There's one bed under the far window, with space next to it for another. Ilex's sleeping bag is unrolled and covered in a few blankets. They look expensive, made of thick grey wool and pale blonde fake fur. He must have stolen them, or else taken them when he left his parents' house. Trust Ilex to shun cheap fleecy throws. There are pin-up pictures on the wall, torn out of GT, according to the logo, which I take to mean Gay Times. On the floor is a stack of crime novels and piles of old magazine, Gay Times, Empire and SFX. Poking out from the sleeping bag is the neck of a bottle. I don't look any closer. I leave and find myself outside Sophia's door. Curiosity makes me step through into the velvet draped weirdness of her room. I let out a silent yelp when I see Sophia staring directly at me. She's sitting cross-legged in her big armchair, incense smoke hanging in the air, though the sticks on the altar have turned to ash. She doesn't move or even blink, and I realise that she's sitting in the middle of a circle made of salt. If I could feel my heart, I know it would be beating hard, but everything in me is still as I move slowly towards her. Still, Sophia doesn't move, and I begin to think that she must be astral projecting, just like me. Cray said she did it all the time. Looking at her glazed eyes, I wonder where she is. In another part of town? Another country? Maybe she's on another plane altogether, seeing things I can't even imagine. I glide out through the wall and go into the girls' room to look out over the fields behind the house. There's a woman in the garden of one of the houses at the edge of the village, a big house with leaded windows and a chimney. She's in the walled garden, clipping holly from the hedge, decorating for Christmas. The need to see my parents stings me again, and I cross my arms over my chest. Astral me is cold, and it's got nothing to do with the conditions inside the house. I want to see my parents. I blink, and I'm looking in through a window, instead of out of one. It's the front window of my home, my real home. For a moment I feel light-headed, confused. Then I realise that I'm still on the astral plane. I thought that one outside my body, I'd have to travel everywhere like I would normally, but apparently I was wrong. The house looks different to the last time I saw it, the night Dad threw me out, the night Mum wouldn't open the door. There are old leaves all over the front path, all brown and rotted. Wet leaflets for takeaways down the road are buried in the sludge. Everyone else in the street has their lights up, icicles and blinky twinkly stars, but our white nest of bulbs isn't hanging over the front window. The curtains are drawn tight. I know it's stupid, but I can't help thinking my dad will see me as soon as I ghost my way inside. I'm actually scared of seeing him, his furious red face glaring at me, telling me without words what a disappointment I am. I jump as the gate clatters against the post behind me. There he is. He's dressed for work, black trousers tight on his legs, under his big black fleece. I always used to think he looked like a bear in that. He doesn't look at me, just digs his keys out and, with a defeated slump of his shoulders, opens the front door. I slip in after him. I'm back, he calls. There's no response. He tugs off his fleece. The hallway is crackly with tension. I can almost see it hanging around him. Being near him is difficult, so I lag behind as he goes into the lounge. It smells like home, pledge and oven chips and the collection of wool coats and old shoes in the hall. In the living room, the TV is off, which is almost unheard of. Mum likes the noise, so she always has it on when she's home alone. She knits or irons or reads with Bargain Hunt or Who Do You Think You Are on in the background. Calf, love, Dad calls. In here. Mum's voice comes from the kitchen and I follow Dad out there. Mum's sitting at the kitchen table, just like she was the night they threw me out. 
There's a newspaper on the table in front of her, a notepad off to the side. There are still toast crumbs all over the counter, washing up stacked by the sink from breakfast. Normally Dad would have cleaned that up, or Mum would have gotten around to it while he was at work. But Kathy, you're still working on that. I want to get it right. It's almost Christmas, and I want this to be... I just want to say the right thing. You will. Of course you will. I crane my neck, gliding forwards to peek at the notepad. There's a noise like a hundred wasps all boring into my head at once. My vision goes black. Blind, I panic and try to scream, but no sound comes out. There's a cold grip around me like a wet sheet. I fight against it and there's a sharp pain in the back of my head. I open my eyes and realise that I'm back in my body. I can see and breathe and hear. I'm on my back on the bare floor, the candle and ocean of tarry wax in front of me. I feel like I'm about to throw up or cough up my heart. My skin is goose pimpled and crawling all over. I'm covered in sweat and when I rub the back of my head and struggle to sit up, the room spins. The door creaks open and Cray is kneeling beside me. Michaela? His hand is warm and solid on my back. I turn and burrow against his soft hoodie, which smells like incense smoke and feels warm against my cheek. There are tears in my eyes, but I'm too frightened to care. Hey, he says softly, wrapping his arms around me. What happened? I was... I was... I'm stuttering helplessly, and he rubs my back through it. I... On the astral, I, I went to my parents' house. I, I don't know how. I was watching them, and then there was this noise, like buzzing and static. And I couldn't see. I couldn't move, and then I was here. I can't stop shaking. It's all right now. You're back, and it's safe here, Cray says. I cast a circle. I did everything right. I believe you. We'll find out what happened, I promise. I'm so tired. But at the same time, I'm afraid to close my eyes in case the cold darkness swamps me again. Cray seems to sense this because he squeezes me gently and says, Why don't we stay up a while? I'll light some more candles and we can play some cards. I nod, feeling like a little kid, while he lays out our bedding so we have somewhere to sit. With candles glowing and Cray's knee against mine as he deals, I feel a little better, grounded and safe. Under my skin, though, I'm still cold. Even when it gets late and Cray can't keep his eyes open anymore, I can't settle down to sleep. I lie next to him looking up at the ceiling and feeling very alone and out of my depth. Because that was actually quite a long chapter, I'm just going to leave it at reading chapter 19 for this episode. Uh, so chapter 20 will be in the next one. I hope you're enjoying the story so far and uh, don't forget that you can also buy the book for 99p to read along or read ahead or to reread the book. In the meantime, keep an eye out for reviews and unboxings on the YouTube channel as well as on the podcast and uh, I'll see you in the next one. Bye.